And for more on the latest development of the driverless cars and many other fascinating aspects, we are joined here in the Beijing studio by Mr. Lutik, who is the general manager of uh, JAC Design Center in Italy and also JAC's global design president. Welcome to our program. Also joining us here in Beijing, we have uh, Mr. Samuel Shufa, who is the design director for Econa. Welcome as well. And joining us from Washington, D.C. in the United States, uh, we are having Mr. Levi Tillman, who is the managing partner of Balance Strategies and also author of the book, The Great Race, The Global Quest for the Car of the Future. Welcome as well. Fascinating, fascinating, and fascinating. Driverless cars really is the topic many people are talking about these days. What about its latest development? How far are we, really, from the two of you? Uh, are we from the real driverless car that is supposed to be safe? Mr. Wow. Tick? Well, I think uh, it's not far. I mean, things are coming and uh, there's- some hesitation in your voice. Is that far or not far? It's not far. <laughs> it's definitely not far. Mm. It's coming very soon. I think there's a dozens of companies doing that really deep development into this field, which in US and also, a lot of majority investment doing putting in also China. Mm. JAC as uh, the number eight of Chinese automotive maker, we are investing also a lot in the driverless car and the autonomous driving as well. For the driverless car, you're already having your trials in China. Yes, so we have our uh, demi car, which we have around a hundred thousand kilometers on road testing already okay. in China. Interesting. And what about you, Mr. Shufa? Well, I can see for myself as you work for several manufacturers that uh, many of them are actually developing this. And if they don't say so, it's because they are a little bit behind and they see what the other go guys are going to develop. In fact, uh, the main issue that we see now is not technical. We know that Volvo, Nissan as well have yeah. been advertising very loudly this technology that they, I believe, control very well. Google, we can also say, it, made a huge trial and control it. Mm. Uh, the real issue, I believe, is in fact in the car insurance. Uh, and uh, everything uh, that uh, will will come from this, you know, whether the consumer will accept that uh, this is whether it's partly his responsibility, uh, or he will uh, go back towards the manufacturers. All right, and uh, Mr. Tillman, how far do you think really? If you could give us a number, that would be really great. <laughs> well, I think Samuel is exactly right. The technology is making swift progress, and so. Um, although the United States and some of the companies that are based here are in the lead, I think the Chinese companies are also able to close the gap fairly quickly from a technical standpoint. Um, but where we do see a lot of problems to overcome, and where China has a real opportunity to perhaps leapfrog the rest of the pack, is in the policy that governs autonomous vehicles. Because that is poised to be a real obstacle to autonomous vehicle deployment. And everyone is working their way through the policy issues right now. So, so if you were to just take policy off the table, I would say that 2020 would mm -hmm. be a good target year for high level three, perhaps level four autonomous vehicles. What that means um, when we say level three is a car that can essentially drive itself within certain settings, perhaps on the highway. Level four is an autonomous vehicle that can drive itself in basically all settings. Mm -hmm. um, 2025, I would say, is a far out prediction. You know, I think if we don't have these vehicles ready by 2025, mm -hmm. I'll be surprised. Interesting. Uh, internationally, uh, Mr. Tick, we already heard uh, that in the city of London, for example, next year there will also be trials uh, or massive trials of the driverless cars on the street. That's at least according to the British government. And secondly, you have got Google testing in different kinds of geographical and temperature locations uh, throughout the United States just to see the heat, you know, the uh, the sand and also the atmosphere, what would that mean for the driverless car? These are going already to some very specific stages. When is China gonna be? You didn't give an answer about the timing. I'm sure you can be more specific this time. Uh, well, it's uh, actually a good point and a good question. Mm. Uh, good I question because you have an answer or not have an answer? <laughs> no, I mean, I think I might have a half answer. Okay. <laughs> uh, like uh, uh, Mr. Levy say, the, poli the politic of the driverless car is uh, one of the most optical to put the actual the driverless car on the road. Mm. 
because the uh, road is complicated. How can you mix with the driveless car and with the drive car? You know, and uh, how the car in artificial intelligence can react at a really good way. But what about humans? Right. And uh, when these have the conflict, and uh, who take the responsibility, and who set the law and the rule to define the right and wrong side? The rule is exactly the point. Exactly. What about the rules? There are several points about the rules. First of all, uh, Mr. Shufa, is what about the road policy? Driverless cars, non driverless cars, uh, who's going to be responsible for what? That's one thing. Secondly, uh, what about uh, some of the uh, specific numbers of possible accidents? Uh, Google, for example, recently already given a number of possibly 30,000 uh, uh, accidents are likely to happen even with driverless car. It is already much fewer than human caused accidents, but We've already know at the very beginning of the year we are likely to have one thirty thousand. Can people accept that? So these are all very important aspects of the policy. We are accepting to take the plane, which spend most of its time with a computer flying the plane. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, we also will not be comfortable, I believe, if the pilot was not qualified. And this is a very that's where we start seeing the change here of who is the user? Is the user somebody capable or incapable? Uh, you were asking the question when? In China, never soon enough. It is clear that in China, it, the roads will be a better place if uh, people will have a driverless cars and the cars will be uh, uh, doing the things you know, smoothly, maybe. Uh, and I think there are a number of countries where this will help a lot. Yeah. Uh, in other places, uh, we have uh, some more questions even on top of that one, which is what becomes the definition of the car if the car has no longer a driver and the car becomes a very different kind of product. Like the phone, we, we saw the, the phone industry has changed definition to a certain extent. Yes, the, the, the winner of yesterday, such as Nokia, is now a complete loser. And uh, Apple is a winner today. Tomorrow, who knows? Things can change. Kodak, another example. So technology can bring us in an evolution. What seems to be an evolution, the, the digital camera uh, might make tomorrow the losers. Mm. So all of these unpredictabilities would pose certain kinds of challenges to the policy setting. In other words, sometimes policymakers could be swayed by very strong interest groups to move one direction or the other. Uh, Mr. Tillman, what about policy-wise from the U.S.? After all, Google is still a company based in the U.S. Uh, and it is having the most advanced uh, technologies as we see. Yeah, I mean, I think one thing to remember is that once you get to level four autonomy, that's a fully autonomous vehicle, these really aren't cars in the traditional sense mm. anymore. They're robots. Uh, sometimes we call them car bots. And so what that means is the regulatory structure ought to be quite different from the one that we have today for cars. Today, we have something called the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards that dictate all sorts of things about how you have to put a car together, where the high beam headlight button has to be, how certain hoses have to be clamped. And that's just going to be fundamentally different for an mm. autonomous vehicle. Um, right now, the United States policy approach to autonomous vehicles is a little bit diffuse. You have on the federal level, the Department of Transportation working through some regulatory processes where they're going to recommend a set of regulations to govern autonomous vehicles, but also on a state level, you have state legislatures, and then you have um, surprisingly powerful forces like the California Department of Motor Vehicles mm -hmm. also working on their own separate tracks to govern autonomous cars. And so it's a very complicated, messy story right now, and it's going to be very interesting to see how it shakes out. Mm. Of course, the U.S. has always been a very interesting story because of the federal system it has. Uh, the state vis-a-vis -vis national. But what about another area, uh, which is who is going to be the winners and who is going to be the losers? And now we talk about uh, Google and Uber and many of the so-called new companies very eager to push forward driverless cars. Meanwhile, you also got traditional automakers trying to, at least just like your companies, mm -hmm. try to set one part of it uh, focusing on driverless cars. But this could also mean challenges for these traditional auto industry. Uh, according to some estimates, General Motors, for example, and Ford companies, if uh, 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 driverless cars could become somewhat mainstream by the year 2020, as Mr. Tillman mentioned earlier, has to cut their workforce by a huge 
a chunk. And even their research centers around the world, manufacturer centers around the world, from more than 30 to only 17. That at least is the current number we could have. So having said that, though, Mr. Tick, who's going to be the winners and who's going to be the losers? If the auto industry is going to have a swing hard, um, what would that mean for the speed of the technology and the cooperation between the policy side and also the auto industry? Uh, well. It's, uh, it's a lot of questions. Another good question. <laughs> uh, I think, you know, there's not a clear winner or loser. You know, the traditional automaker like us, we will have to work with the uh, upcoming players from internet side, mm. which are focused uh, really much in the user experience side. You know, we might join with them, have a joint venture and a joint force or uh, IND team put together to do a new section for the driverless car, you know, which basically really heavily focus on the user experience, legislation, but maybe we will work together with the uh, political party to set up the legislation mm. for the driverless car. It must to be. And uh, if we do this way, I think we will be a win-win together. Mm. And uh, otherwise, uh, that would be quite hard to define who would be the winner and the loser. Right. But I think also for uh, the internet, like uh, Google and Apple, which they announced already they're doing the driverless car. Okay. And then uh, for them, also really hard to do things alone because the automotive industry is a 100 years old industry. And uh, you have a 100 years of a collection of uh, knowledge technology, you, the way people use car, I mean, behave. You guys are important. Yes, we understand. But what <laughs> about you, uh, Mr. Tillman? Uh, would this uh, debate, as being mentioned by Mr. Taker, would make everybody a lobbyist, everybody uh, try to work uh, with the policymakers? Will mm. they make uh, the new so-called technology companies go against uh, the automakers or vice versa? As I was hearing the other day, an interview of uh, one of the most uh, renowned automakers of the world, uh, he was suggesting, well, we just heard the news from the media, just as everybody else uh, in the world about the latest development of the driverless cars. Isn't that interesting? Mr. It Tillman. is. I mean, I think that when you look at the automotive industry right now, um, you have to look at it through 3D, uh, which means three disruptions. You have electrification, you have automation, and then you have new mobility, which is services like Lyft and Uber. And all of these forces are conspiring to fundamentally transform the world of automobiles as we know it today. And it's really too much for any one person to keep up with. Um, we are surprised that at Valence, uh, we have big, sophisticated automotive companies coming to us and saying, hey, you have to come and uh, help us make sense of this because there are just so many new dynamics within mm. the industry that, that it's hard for even very sophisticated, entrenched players to understand how to cope with this shifting landscape. Mm. Uh, Mr. Shufa, eventually before we go, what do you think will be the issue? Is it the technology? Is it the consumer habits? Or is it really the politics? I think the politics is what will help us to make it happen. I think the technology is, uh, when people are ready, they are going to be the winners. The people that are not ready are going to be the losers. Uh, but I think that beyond that, beyond that question is going to be, what is always the consumer going to use this product? And at that point, uh, this might change the way we use the product. And at that point, if it becomes just a commodity, everybody is actually a loser because mm -hmm. a car is a very emotional car, emotional yes. product. Yes, indeed. Uh, Mr. Tillman, your final words, very briefly, 10 seconds. Well, I, I think it's an exciting time. We're going to see more change in the next 10 years than we've seen in the last 100 years. And there are huge opportunities for China here. Okay. Huge opportunities to reduce pollution and to reduce congestion and to make a more efficient, safer society.